We are talking once again with Ari Cohn. He is the president and founder of the Post Prison Education Program. Ari, good to talk with you. We, uh, you have multiple guests with us today. Hoping you can uh, introduce them. I can. I can. Uh, the the background to to this is um, June of last year. Uh, Teresa Walsh uh, sent and found us on the internet and sent an email uh, and um, I could actually read some of it, but uh, she was working on her master's degree thesis and and I this is not how she wrote it, but she wanted to basically borrow our students and graduates for her research. That's the way I that's the way I offered it back. And so we um, we put Teresa in our WebEx communication system. So actually a prisoner uh, can dial toll free into our office, push extension number, what is it? McKenna would have to tell you, but and it, it, it reach at the time, Teresa was in Tanzania and had been in Tanzania for four years, which was super cool. And, and, and with, University of London in Tanzania, and then, uh, and then they can talk. Uh, now she's in Ireland, so we're and we're like ten thirty in the morning, and I guess you're like eight thirty at night, Teresa. So, um, and then on uh, about a month ago, we we got the final thesis that Teresa wrote, and so today's to talk and I love the thesis and and it says everything I would have wanted it to say and it corroborates our work and our beliefs and that's really why I wanted this radio show so Teresa Walsh um, is with us from London and then I'm uh, Ireland excuse me and and uh, in the upper right hand corner is McKenna Kearns who's actually here in the office and uh, and our applicant and student services work. And she's been on your show before, Mike. She and Marla were on it last about, well, pre, pre-COVID, so who knows when it was. And, and, uh, and then uh, Maddie Gates is lower right uh, and is also doing applicant and student services. And so they're, they're like nonstop, every day sort of living what Teresa researched and found out about and working with people um, who are going through the process that Teresa wrote about. And so like, why don't, if, if, why don't you, it'd be probably good for me to just shut up and Teresa um, and, and McKenna and Maddie say something. And then I've got one thought it's sort of an overriding pet peeve of mine, and then we'll just open up the conversation. So, Teresa, you want to kick in? Uh, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think you you kind of covered our our intro, Ari. I reached out to Post Prison Education Program ooh, over a year ago now, um, which is crazy to think, um, because I was pursuing a degree in organizational psychology and was just like very interested in doing some qualitative research on. Uh, the formerly incarcerated as they, you know, re-entered the labor market for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but the reason that I particularly was interested in working with post-prison education program, Ari, you kind of referenced this before, uh, I guess before we went live, but uh, desistant, you guys did a lot of, or rather your program was undergirded with desistance focused re-entry and, um, I think that that's, uh, you know, positioning the formerly incarcerated as the experts of their situation, not having like an external researcher, te- like even like myself telling them what what should be done, but allowing them to um, to be empowered and to take control of that. And uh, more so, as you referenced the the journey of reentry, it's not this like suspended event or something that just happens and then like a light switch and then, you know, you're done, it's continuous, it's fluid, it has its ups and downs and it's not fixed. Um, but what really stuck out to me um, 
even more so as I was starting to do, you know, just have conversations with participants from uh, your program was just that you really took, uh, I think, you know, you can look at the word rehabilitation in a few different ways. You could look at it in like a very medical way of like correcting a person and finding the deficits and figuring out what's wrong with them. Or you could kind of look at, I guess, like strength based. So what's strong with them instead, right? And I felt like post-prison education program, as I was talking to everybody, they definitely felt like that's what you were doing. You were meeting them where they were. Um, and it, you know, it was such a, such a privilege to be able to, to do that research and to kind of learn about their journey and to see how, um, how your program really helped them along the way or, and continues to help them in, uh, in respect to their uh, self-efficacy beliefs and how they, um, you know, just move forward in pursuit of their goals. McKenna, Maddie, you guys want to flip a coin and see who talks next? I can go first if you don't mind, okay. Maddie. Yeah. So my name is McKenna, and I've been working at the program on and off for about two years now. And I have learned so incredibly much since being here. I started as a high school intern, so I'm a sophomore in college now and going through the education process myself. But I was really struck by a lot of elements of Teresa's thesis and found that so many of the, and I'm excited to go into detail about these, but so many of the definitions that she drew like really helped put words into what I think a lot of post-prison does, which was really helpful because of the personalized approach that is taken so often. And so I'm really excited to dive into some of the reasons that she highlighted as to why that's effective and why that's so important to people. And I've also been really struck by those cultural and identity changes that happen to people, not just while they're incarcerated, but both before and after in a way that Teresa highlights really, really intelligently in her thesis about talking about this um, self-efficacy and advocacy and the way in which identity is built around environment and other factors. And so when those change, things get much more complicated. And so I appreciate that both this thesis and post-prison's mission in general, as Teresa was starting to touch on, is holistic, I think, in nature and really considers what happens at every step in the criminal legal system and what leads people there and what happens after they uh, leave prisons because that simply is not the end of the journey and often it becomes a factor that characterizes much of people's lives as it should not be but that's my two cents so on to maddie <laughs> mckenna definitely covered most of it but um i've worked as a student services counselor for about two months now um, and I think the thing about Teresa's research that really rang true for me was how individualized and personal the experience is. Um, it's not linear, it's always a continuous journey. And being a counselor, I'm sure McKenna can agree, um, you're really alongside these people going through the ups and downs with them the entire way. Um, and I'm actually a psychology major at the University of Washington. So hearing that experience from a cognitive psychology perspective is really cool and I'm excited to talk more about it. So what really, um, you know, I guess my first thought with this was, and we, we did a town hall, um, you know, Mike, you've heard this one, something bothers me enough that I rent town hall, which is thousands and thousands of dollars and then spend a whole bunch of money getting people to come listen. But we we did one uh, called the Big Lie, and part part of uh, was the most recent town hall, and and when I read Ter Teresa's paper and looked back at our history, um, it, it just made me think of, of this big lie that the legislature and the governor consistently and government at every level. So King County here, King County Council, City of Seattle Council. Washington State Legislature and the feds, they want to make, they want the public to think that recidivism or as 
I learned a new word from Teresa, desistance, uh, which we'll talk about. I want to get to Teresa to talk about desistance. Uh, so like, it, uh, uh, it is this really difficult, impossible thing. It's just, it's this quagmire, it's unsolvable, mystical, nobody can fix it. But the legislator, you know, they're kind of like Tarzan in the jungle beating themselves. And just, you're like, I'm, we're working our butts off to fix this. And we're, <laughs> we're heroes and, 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 and we'll get to the bottom of it. And the, and the reality is stopping people from recidivism is easy. It's, it's hard, but we know how to do it. So it's not easy. And it's certainly not easy for the people who are reentering society. But the answer to recidivism is known. And we've proved it over the last 16 years. And what I really loved maybe the most about what Teresa came, wrote in her thesis is that, that she came to this to the same result that it's it's a it's a it's a it's a you can map it out you can map out success and so um it's infuriating when it's very clear what needs to be done for people to build lives worth living to not die from overdose not die from suicide not recidivate not return to prison it's it's it, it's a it's it's mapped out in Teresa's thesis which we'll send to anybody that wants it. Seriously, just send me an email, send McKenna an email, send Maddie an email. Uh, we'll email it to anybody that asks for it. And so, um, it's, and I'm like ra.cone at postprisonedu.org and Maddie is at maddie.gates or just Maddie? You have to answer. Maddie.gates. Okay, McKenna? At postprisonedu. Mine's just McKenna at post prison edu. Yeah, so e email any of us and we'll send this thesis to you. Uh, but it's, it, it maps out uh, just exactly what's necessary to stop recidivism. And, and, and we've proven over the last 16 years that if, if you follow pretty much this map, uh, then, um, then recidivism, it puts the brakes, it'll put the brake on recidivism and, and stop doing stupid things, start doing smart things. So I thought we can go anywhere with this conversation that we want, but one of the, that Teresa wants, because I really want to get her talking and, and me shutting up, but uh, I wanted to start off with the word desistance. So like, I'm 700 years old, and I've been to multiple colleges, University of Florida, University of North Carolina, University of Washington, some community colleges, and I've never seen that word before. And so when I read it in the thesis, I had to look it up. And it's, it's, a, it's a European UK word that, that I don't think exists in the United States, but should. And, um, uh, and I actually, when I looked it up, I ended up, this was cool, I ended up on the website from Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service in England uh, to get the definition. Um, and I just want to get, for starters, I want to get uh, Teresa to talk about the systems, and then I've got a couple other questions in this, then we can go wherever we want with the rest of this. Sure. Uh, so... When I was engaging uh, just with kind of the academic literature, uh, you know, before reaching out, I learned that desistance is kind of a term, I guess the definition of it would be just like a long term abstinence from from crime and it's a process or a journey. So depending on when you look back, right, um, you could have, a, I believe, they'll kind of separate desistance into primary and secondary desistance. So at, at some point, you know, you could see that someone has desisted from from crime um but maybe if you zoom out a little bit further uh that desistance might not you know they might not be desisting anymore so i think one um one thing that i saw was that because they categorized it into kind of like a two a two layer definition secondary desistance was more about that that continuous journey and that kind of um self-perform that happens internally through as uh as we might have referenced like or as i referenced in my thesis through interactions between your environment through interpersonal factors and through behaviors and that's just like something that's very bi-directional and always 
kind of occurring. But I think the the primary um, point or takeaway from the assistance that I'd want um, people to to kind of internalize is yeah, it's a journey and it's something that is is mutable and it's fluid and you know it's it's very continuous. Yeah, the, the Her Majesty the Queen says that it doesn't usually happen overnight. That's right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. It, it, and all the stories that, you know, I was privileged enough to to hear from the participants in your program, there's so much dynamism to them. You saw people kind of going up and down and just knowing, I, I guess, that they had that connection with you and they had that uh that safety net and the networks that you were assisting uh, them with kind of connecting to, I think was what really helped them continue on on forward, um, even when there were, you know, sometimes some some setbacks or hardships that uh, that they needed to overcome. And, you know, can you, uh, you and Hannah and I talked about this the other day, Bandura. And, and, and how I met Bandura when I was trying to get a master's degree in psychology back in the 1800s. And can you talk about um, the part that Bandura and what I call social learning plays in the systems and, and then and, and, and your and your outcomes and, uh, and what you attribute that to? Yeah, sure. So, um... Actually, I used uh, Bandura's social cognitive theory just as the theoretical, theoretical framework in which to kind of understand the, the data and the research that I was collecting from, from the participants. And basically, like I said, Bandura's social cognitive theory says that like the environment, different um, interpersonal factors like your effective state, your cognitive state, your physical state, all of those interact with and interlock with your behaviors and will affect um, your perceptions of what you can do, essentially self-efficacy and um, re-entry outcomes. But one core concept, I think, Ari, that uh, would be especially relevant to post-prison education program is the concept of vicarious learning, um, which is learning through the observation of others. And the more similar, or rather, the more similarity we find between ourselves and that role model or that referring other, the stronger um, our belief in what we can do becomes. Uh, and uh, I guess another um, precept of the theory is also that behaviors are shaped by, not only by our ability, but by past performance and, um, you know, internal or external reinforcements. And what's really interesting is the theory states that, like, our belief in ourself and our belief in what we can do is often a better predictor than our past behavior. So when you're working together to give people that like a hope and that encouragement, you, um, yeah, depending on how their level of self-efficacy, that would be a, a more reliable predictor than maybe what they've done in the past. Can we gonna pop in? Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. No, you're good. Um, I was just going to hop in and maybe I haven't experienced it because I haven't, I've only worked here in COVID times. Um, but it reminds me of the observational learning aspect of the dog and pony shows, but I know Ari's done. I'm not sure if McKenna's done as well, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Teresa. Oh, wait, sorry. I didn't hear like it. Can you just or are you, even if you want to talk about your experience with them? With the students or? Yeah, in terms of what they do for the students or the applicants, I guess I should say. Well, you know, I'm like, I'm on page nine of the thesis and, um, and there's this paragraph, which I not only highlighted, but checked with a red <laughs> pen, you know, because it's, it, 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 it's just really interesting. You, you know, Teresa, you come along years after we started work and and years after we started going into the prisons with former prisoners. Like McKenna and I were just on a hour long thing doing exactly what Bandura and your thesis are about. So like a, a woman that used to be Dean of Education over the Monroe, Monroe Correctional Complex, uh, 
went back east to get her PhD and she now teaches classes with at-risk youth. And she reached out mm -hmm. to me, I don't know, a couple of months ago and asked if I could get some of our students and graduates together um, to talk to these at-risk youth because they're at a point in their life, they're 16, 17, 18 years old, where they're gonna make bad decisions that, that lead them further into the judicial whatever you call this criminal justice system that we've got here. Um, and, and, or they're gonna put the brakes on, change course and, do, and make wise decisions that keep them free and, and, and help them build lives. And so um, Keith Whiteman was just talking to that class. We were in a Zoom with him and uh, about us coming into the prison where he was at in 2008 and, 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 and you talked, Teresa, you talked to Keith multiple times. I know I've, I've gone back to your, I went back to your paper and I added attribution so I could keep track of that. <laughs> that was Keith, that was Dolphy, that was Jenny, that was Jenny, that was Jenny. <laughs> and, and, uh, but he, this morning he talked to these young people about, you know, the power of, of us coming into a prison where he was and, and, and showing him an alternative that he didn't know existed. And so like you wrote uh, about high quality jobs are harder to obtain um, if, if, if a incarcerated person possesses limited awareness of their career interests, needs, values, abilities, and, and then in a heightened sense of what they can't do, or that's not for me, or they don't even know that there's a community college or university in their town, which is often the case. And so, and then, and then Keith talked about um, when he worked here after he came out of prison, he worked here for several years and um, about going back into prison. So Dolphy Jordan, who you talked to, Teresa, was on the mm -hmm. call this morning. Dolphy was eloquent this morning. And, and, and so we, go, we do these dog and pony shows is what we call them, where we go back into the prison mm -hmm. and we might meet with 300 people at the Stafford Creek Correction Center or 60 women at the Washington Correction Center for Women or depending on the, how old the prison is or where it is, you know, what it is, it, it could be 60 to 300 people and take former prisoners back. Is, I hope this amount is what you were looking for. If it wasn't, throw something at me. You know, like a donut, no, it was. A, a coffee <laughs> donut. <laughs> so like, um, but, and, uh, you know, we we don't go back to prison with a bunch of pansies who just did a, a year in prison or something. We, you know, we, we take people that did 21 years for first degree murder or 13 years for first, first degree murder or 13 years for manslaughter or 11 years for identity theft and drug dealing and using. And, and it's just people have done serious crimes multiple times and been incarcerated a lot. And they stand in front of a room of current prisoners and talk about how how education changed their life and and people and and you know people that are locked up or look at these and they may know them they may you know Dolphy was down for so long they might very well have known Dolphy as as a friend when they were locked up together and um but that's life changing for them and and it it, it opens up the door to possibility and and uh so McKenna, you wanna you were gonna say something a minute ago, and then we Yes, I have another question for Teresa. Returning back to some of those interpersonal connections that you were talking about. In your thesis, you seem to highlight trust a lot and the relationship building that's involved there. And so I was hoping that you could just speak to where you saw trust, where you saw its absence in this process, and then what value you saw in trust between individuals and maybe how we can cultivate that? I know that's a great question. And I think um, what I noticed most uh, when I was speaking to all of the participants is that they had a very clear line of demarcation between groups that they could trust, which, um, you know, it, it's individuals who had very similar lived experience, um, and who were genuinely there to to support them and to help them and to um, who came around them like a I think they use the words family a lot and community uh, and that was in stark relief to um, 
the DOC or to, I guess, programs that were being implemented, uh, you know, within the prison by the individuals or by parties that they viewed as um, parties that were meant to correct or control their behavior. And what I noticed the most was that it, they seemed to believe that that support and that assistance could not be dispensed um, by the groups that were meant to to be managing or overseeing you or controlling you because it just there there was no trust there and when there is no trust and when there's no relatability there's no willingness to um you know to to participate or to act in any of the programs even if they were well designed so what i noticed um a, as you mentioned like the, there were three emergent themes in my thesis so one was trust and relatedness um one was just like the the immediate environment um and then um wait what was the last one sorry future vision future vision yeah and then um, the future vision which was what ari had just been talking about just this understanding of what is possible and um and what you can obtain so i think that all of those were very, as I said, like bi-directional and you needed to, in order to actually meet the very complex needs of, of a person, um, you had, they had to have, you had to cultivate that trust so you could understand when and where they, they might want to have your help and, you know, they'd be willing to reach out. Um, I think one of the quotes that I, I got that really resonated with me um, from one of the participants was they had said that the window of willingness was like would open, but it was a very short period of time. And if someone's not there to, if you reach out your hand and someone's not there to grasp it at that time, then you lose that opportunity. Um, it was Keith. I think that was Keith. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, along what you were just saying, I'm, I'm it's on page 22. It, 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 in the United States, Teresa, if you say the F word, my radio station will lose its license to the FCC. They'll swoop in in helicopters and gunships, take him to prison and disband the radio station. And so even though it's the most common word in the United States, I think you can't say it on the radio station. So I'm going to, uh, but I'm going to read this quote from Derek. So, and so and when Derek talked to Teresa, he was he's still in prison he was he's like uh, more than a decade into a 14 year sentence uh and he's uh uh and it's for doing something that he didn't do uh and so but he, here's this quote uh uh he's and this is him talking to Teresa. he says i hate doc i have tattoos that say f the doc and and he didn't use the abbreviation for the F word either. This program we're all in is way different than any of the DOC programs. This program, the post-prison education program, is like a family. Once you get accepted, man, get ready to get a family. You're going to get email from everyone, calls from everyone. It's bigger than just reentry for them. But that's trust. That's the trust you were talking about. I want to ask you, um, Teresa, like if you were standing in front of the Washington State Legislature, or uh, or the or, or our governor's worthless fake council on on reducing recidivism, what what's the one thing that you would tell them that's most important, based on your research? You're standing in front of the Washington State Legislature to combine the Senate and the House of Representatives, and you can say anything you want. And not objective is to have people stop dying, stop recidivating, dying from overdose, dying from suicide, returning to prison. Like, what's the most important thing based on your study that you tell them? That's um, you, you. You can talk about question. that for twenty-five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk from out of the end. <laughs> yeah, I guess to be to make it most succinct, more programs like post-prison education program, more programs that are able to meet that wide range of co-occurring needs. I think that, you know, it's, as you said earlier in this talk, it's not easy. There, There's not a silver bullet in regard to like one program that's just going, like, or rather not one program, one inter one very simple intervention that's going to be able to allow people to desist. It's something, it's a, 
program that needs to be very holistic, right? But you you guys are on it. And I think that when you think of all the, uh, like the pernicious effects that structures or, you know, so modes of social thinking have on on these more vulnerable populations. The, the thing that I thought the most when I was doing this research was that this is really quite an invisible population. Cause I mean, when you think about, um, you know, there's growing awareness and federal protection for like different diversity initiatives for like more historically disenfranchised groups, right? Like based on gender, religion or race, but there's very few controls for biases against uh, ex-offenders and that's crazy to me when you think like the demographic of individuals who are incarcerated I think it's like 40 to 50 percent of people like in every state who are incarcerated come from the lowest socioeconomic like quintile in in their state so there are just these individuals who are already at extreme disadvantage in life and then you put them in a system that's supposed to help them or support them or correct them. And they brush against the system and they're just worse off than before. It's like you stamp them with like a scarlet letter, like hung a, a leper bell over them or something. Like you just, you're not, the intention of what's supposed to happen is not happening. So I think what, what needs to occur is you need to rethink what the purpose of prison is. Um, it should be a place of rehabilitation, re-entry, and you know, programs like post-prison education programs should be occurring from, from day one. Um, and then like more broadly, I guess, and this would be likely <laughs> more expensive to implement, but there are, you know, besides just supporting this group of people um, once they're in incarcerated and then post-incarceration, there's just fundamental structural issues that are enhancing like our our income inequality too right like i don't know i think i wrote about one in the thesis but like ring fencing taxes to schools right so like the amount of tax that you pay for your property is equivalent to like the quality of education that you're getting so you're just making the poor poor and like why why is that okay like so there are big things that could be redressed right now they are a lot more expensive i guess for the plutocrats or the people on top to, to um, implement. But I think, you know, in, in the interim, while we have what we have right now, you need programs like post-prison education program that are very human centered that recognize that a, a person has, or like supporting a person is messy and complex. And it's going to require um, a lot of different supports, especially because they originally came from more of a disadvantaged um, background. And, you know, things that work for re-entry are uh, being connected to your community, being connected to um, social structures and family. And that's the exact opposite of what prison is is doing for us, having a sense of like commitment um, to the next generation. I think they call it just generativity in the literature. But all of those things, like prison does not help with. In fact, it, it, it makes it worse. I don't know if that really answered the <laughs> question. Yeah. But I want to I say just, something like that to them. <laughs> I, I, you know, I went searching for this quote you had when you talked to Jenny in, in terms of like government wrongheaded thinking. So like her husband was being prosecuted um, at a, a point and, um, and I actually was in the Court of Appeals hearing and a couple other hearings with her just sitting with her to support and, um, <laughs> and but she, the prosecutor this is straight from page 24 of the process. This is Jenny talking to you. She says, I think I was in one of my husband's court hearings and I had a conversation with prosecution and they said, quote, we think that if we give people really long sentences, they learn how to make better decisions. And I was absolutely floored at that statement. And I asked myself as a result of that meeting, that conversation, is this it? But what would, what would you say to that prosecutor? or anybody who thinks <laughs> like he, he did and it was a guy typical oh man i mean i'm so glad that jenny took that and internalized it and used it as motivation to to change the system herself but it is so backwards and you know i think every known study like 
is that in recidivism or desistance has been able to find a, like a very direct relationship between um, someone who has been incarcerated, their legitimate like ties with the community and that just being able to, to be welcomed at home and have those connections and interpersonal um, relationships will help predict like uh, post-prison adjustment. So why you would extend the, like and, and separate people for longer periods of time just seems, you know, very counterintuitive to all of the, the research out there. And like, you know, it, it's just mind blowing, I suppose that, you know, she's had to deal with that, but I'm glad that individuals like her who are actually experts in, in the situation and who have the lived experience um, in it are, are stepping forward and trying to um, make some change. All right, McKenna and Maddie, you're just not going to get away with being quiet the rest of the hour. <laughs> I have another question, if you don't mind, Maddie. Yeah, go for it. I was hoping you could talk about the research method that you took because the reasoning that you gave behind taking more of a qualitative approach versus quantitative, I thought was really reflective of a lot of what you were actually talking about in your thesis and just the focus on anecdotes and how they build into a larger picture. And especially um, you have two quotes on page 29, but at one point you say, while I ultimately value agency in the voice of the individual, it's important to frame these conversations within the boundaries of the reality that they operate. And so I was hoping you could speak to how your research and the way that you collected these stories from people helped you come to that conclusion and maybe how it helped you build an idea of what some of those boundaries are. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that, uh, well, so I, did a, I chose a qualitative method. Um, I had about one to two hour conversations with all of the participants. Uh, there were eight, you know, purpose of sampling because Ari like helped, <laughs> helped connect me with the individuals. Um, I definitely could have talked to them for, for hours and hours though, but we're just trying to be respectful of everybody's time. Kind of, you know, makes you think like, why are we glued to our screens? And there's just such rich, wonderful, story around as we just turn to the person next to us and speak to them. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that in, you know, in desistance and in this type of research, um, everybody wants to know immediately just what works, what's evidence-based and that's, that's good. And, you know, maybe you'll see um, some some fluctuating or like vacillating things where some studies say um, one method's good and some studies say another method's good. But it's kind of like, I've heard, I've seen it compared to like weight loss or um, to like grad school. Would you ever say like, you know, does grad school work? Uh, like, you, you know, you always have like, there's gonna always be different outcomes where people were complex or messy, you know, but you can learn so much from just, um, deep diving into the stories of people that it did work for and that it is working for. So uh, that was part of the reason why I chose um, the method that I chose, but also just because coming from, you know, more of a marginalized population, I think that being able to be, act, you know, enforce that sense of active agency is very important and to provide a platform for individuals who truly are the as I already said, the experts in their situation is very, very important, um, especially uh, yeah, as, as policy is developing. But one thing that I, I was also very cognizant of when I was doing the research was just that, you know, everything, whether it's the research that I'm reading or like thoughts in my head, everything is very culturally and contextually um, contingent, right? So I, I believed in, uh, you know, of course, like empowering uh, individuals to tell their stories, but also I think it was important that we didn't just responsabilize them and place all of the onus on the individual for making those changes because there are larger structures and like systems in place that kind of operate and shape the contours of, of our reality as well. Like I, I referenced earlier, the ring fencing of like um, taxes to, to different neighborhoods, like um, 
how our society is stratified right now. I think that one interesting um, statistic that I had read in in my research was that as income inequality increases, rates of crime also increase, which I, I guess you read that and you think, well, that kind of makes sense. Um, but when you really think about it in the context of of American, like, you know, um, I think Ari, you mentioned this once, like the the extreme wealth that we're seeing right now juxtaposed next to the the extreme non-wealth, I guess, uh, for lack of better terms. Um, and then just seeing how, you know, how that's manifesting um, in our penal system and how we how we react to individuals who have been incarcerated. And I think because America is a place that's you know, I, I guess we were built upon this uh, meritocracy and the belief in like the great man and, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a human capital theory, kind of Margaret Thatcher style stuff, right? Yeah. Um, I think that that's something that I wanted to be very, I never, I didn't want to contribute to that in any way. I wanted to make sure that individuals had a space for their voice, but that they also, um, you know, like, or I recognize that there were a lot of different factors, a confluence of the, of them that were um, responsible for the outcomes. I think, Maddie, can you hear us? I think your, the screen's frozen. I don't know. Pardon me, I can still hear you guys. Oh, good. Okay, good. So I didn't, I didn't know if the internet went out on you or not. No. Um, I do just want to speak, Teresa, to your decision to use qualitative research and the interviews and anecdotes, um, just because I think even from a perspective, knowing that I wanted to go into prison reform and um, helping to end mass incarceration, you know, you, you can see the um, quantitative research and you can see the numbers and at face value, you realize that there's an issue, but you don't truly understand it until you can step into the shoes of these people and actually see how these problems play out in their lives and how real these issues are and how deep they go. Um, and then on top of that, I think that giving them a voice and allowing them to share their story as not just another statistic um, really helps to humanize a population that is dehumanized um, consistently by DOC and um, policies within our country. And I was hoping that you could talk about um, on page seven, you say the systematic othering of the incarcerated individual in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Impact Keep going. the identity. Me? Yeah, I, I, I was I was exactly <laughs> where you're at. It was the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, as the felon label impacts identity construction, external perceptions, and the overt behavior of an individual both pre and post release. So I know Ari and I have both experienced this firsthand with one of our students um, who just has an incredibly low level of self-esteem self uh, as a result of just having to characterize themselves as an offender and as a felon any time that they try to make better decisions in their life, whether it's a job interview or a housing interview, et cetera. Um, and so you mentioned this identity shift that sort of needs to occur um, in terms of giving an individual an identity apart from the felon or the offender label. And I have just as a question for you, if you want to speak to it, is um, which of your approaches or outcomes you found um, between the trust factor or the environmental factor or the future vision factor do you feel like helps an individual establish that identity apart from the labels that um, society uses to dehumanize them? Hmm. I think that's a great question. And huh, which one of those would I say? <laughs> <Good tell? luck. laughs> um, I guess because they are all, you know, interlocking, it's kind of a trick question, isn't it? Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I would say that um yeah, I would say that I want to kind of go the relatedness trust one, like a deep dive into that because one thing that I had 
I had read about and that really rang true for me is that as a society, we are very, um, rituals are very imbued in what we do, right? And when somebody's incarcerated, it's this very public ritual that we all understand. Um, you know, uh, we see we see it a lot on media. We like, you know, you're you get to peer into like um, court cases when people are being um, sentenced, and so that is something that is very front facing, and that we all have, whether we've experienced it directly or not, we understand it, and it's been. Um, kind of concretized into that, like our understanding in society. But when it comes to the re-entry portion, like you don't have the same fanfare, right? There's not a de-labeling ritual or ceremony that occurs. You don't get to, you've been stamped, I, I guess, metaphorically. Um, I think I used the term, like one of the participants actually talked about like wearing a, a scarlet letter, feeling like they were in a caste system that was like um, a forced caste system that, you know, you couldn't break out of. So there, yeah, there's no, I guess there's expungement of record, right? But that is something that wealthier individuals are able to, um, you know, access and it, it's definitely not uh, equitably, um, yeah, equitably accessible. So I wouldn't necessarily count that, but um, yeah, I would say that not having, having that ritualistic, like kind of delabeling process is very difficult. So trust, I would, um, I would highlight because a lot of the times individuals, at least when, when I was speaking to them from post-prison education program, they referenced, um, a role model that they really, uh, admired or an individual that I guess um, usually a teacher, someone from post-prison education program, a met some type of mentor who was acknowledging them and kind of um, assisting in not a silent delabeling process, but kind of like reinforcing, you know, you can, this isn't this uh, label that society has given you. It's not this calcified fixed thing. We can, we can take it off. It's you know, we can decide what, who you are. And um, when they could, when another individual could see that and reflect that back, I think that was uh, who they trusted, um, both on a personal level, but also um, recognized, I guess, maybe had some type of like social capital as well. I think that really helped. You know, um, the, I just want to, I want to ask you a question on the end of the quote that Maddie brought up on page seven. Um, this really struck home when the release prisoners find themselves in quote unquote in, but not of a larger society and suffer from a presumption of moral contamination. But the, the fact that they, that's exactly it. They're released from prison. Um, and so they're in, they're back in society, they're back in the community, but they're not of that community. And I just, and that's so true. And I think it's, a, it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it creates an environment that makes it impossible for people to, or near impossible for people to build decent lives. In, if they're caught up in that, unless, and I think, I think the beauty of the work that Maddie and McKenna do is, is that they, they provide the, the, maybe it's the extra step. I don't know, but, but maybe both of you can describe it, but it's like, it takes more than, than just what the prisoner coming out of prison brings to the table for himself or herself, it, it really, without some kind of intervention and support uh, and others working for you, so often you can't make it. And that's why right now the Department of Corrections has 33.5% of the people come out, catch new felony cases and return to prison within three years, one or more new felony convictions. That's why more than 5,000 people nationally die from overdose or suicide within less than two years of their release from prison. That's why 53% of Washington's prisoners return to prison um, with felony new, new felony convictions over their lifetime, more than half. And it's, it's because that, that the kind of support that 
and not this seems self-serving but i guess it is i mean but what mckenna and maddie and and me I, i'm usually like the whore chasing dollars and 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 not involved in every case but but it's like that's what mckenna and maddie and adrian and, and in years past you know keith and Dolphy and a million other people that have worked here uh do and so like and and i think without it you just get bad outcomes and uh and i'm worried now we're down to the last 10 minutes um but uh and i don't even know where to take that but this the, but uh i thought I, I was really struck uh, i thought it was a really poignant statement you know release prisoners find themselves in quote unquote but not of the larger society and that's horrifying and it's sad mm -hmm. and, and um um i wanted to uh one thing that really I've, I've I've spent like yesterday a couple hours and this morning another hour, and I've underlined and checked red check marks so many things now I can't possibly get to any of them but or all of them but you know what one of the things that really um, infuriates me you addressed on page nine and and it's. Um, it's what I call this get a job, get a job mentality that funders and decision makers make. So the, the lady who's going to become the next secretary of the Department of Corrections in Washington State, Cheryl Strange, is a is a, somebody I regard as a friend, somebody I really care about, really like and, and know well. And when she was in a news conference with the governor the other day, when, in, when the governor was announcing her, her return to the Department of Corrections, um, you know, she talked about three things that are necessary for successful recidivism, and she and, and one of them was was employment, and and I was it was it was it was infuriating to some extent to hear that coming out of Cheryl's mouth, and I'm going to tell her something about it, but and, and send her your thesis because it's not just get a job, it's not just any employment, and you talk about like higher quality employment versus low level employment or just, you know, um, and the, you know, the harder to obtain jobs and stuff like that. But I think a, a driving force with recidivism and, and failure after release is just get a job, get a job and tell you, oh, if we like Chase Bank, I wish somebody go downtown and just blow their building up, you know, so, so, so they have, a, they have a foundation and then you could i'd be the old man out here dancing in the middle of the street and and but uh they have a foundation that's all about this get a job get a job mentality you know it's just like get these former prisoners on a fork <laughs> get them in the hospital let them be clean in bed pants just get them a goddamn job and everything will be okay and, oh. Oh. i had it's all my no that's 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 a malamute <laughs> I have, I've had five Malamutes all my life. My third ex-wife told me that she thought I loved my Malamute more than I loved her, and I didn't respond because I didn't want to get shot. <laughs> but but, but uh, anyway, I I think that's one of the the really downfalls of of government decisions making at every level, and and funders like Chase. You know, it's 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 not get any job. It's like get the job of your dreams. You know, we just, we were just, you know, that all these people that were just on this discussion with this class of at risk youth with us from 915 to 1015, all of the people we had on there, and you talked to many of them, you know, Keith and, 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 and Dolphy included, we didn't have, uh, it, it, we didn't say like, we're going to get you in, to South Seattle College to learn how to cook for others in a culinary arts curriculum. We, we're like, what do you want to be? And if the and, and 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 if the answer is lawyer, then we'll do everything we can to try to make it happen. If it's if if it's if it's like writer, so like uh, Esther's working with a a, a woman who's going to release in the next couple of weeks, and she wants to she wants to be a writer, and and mm -hmm. you know, Maddie was probably on the phone this morning with a prisoner. Uh, did you talk to Kai this morning? I think I think you did. And, and, and who wants who wants to be a paralegal? I think if I'm not mixing it up, but it's like, what do you want to be? 
Um, and if, if it's if it's you want to get a master's degree in social work or you want to be chemical dependency work or lawyer or or Jenny, who you've gotten to know fairly well now, you know, wants a master's degree in public policy, then help them get to that. And those people won't those they won't recidivate and they won't die from overdose. But if you get them to some dead end job under this this focus of like this get a job, get a job, get a job. Oh, if we just get them a job, doesn't matter if they're doing dishes at the rich people's restaurant at Canlis or something. Just get them a job, get them a job, get them a job. So talk to that about that for a minute, if you would. Yeah, definitely. So I think that I, I guess the provenance of that is simply that uh, maybe in research, it's reflected that having a job just makes you more connected to a community, makes you, you know, able to have more stable it's more stability in in your life and so you're able to embed that way but it's not a box ticking exercise where any any job will do as you've already said ari um and i think there's been you know tons of research that show very complex programs that are you know kind of that are you know helping to connect you to a, a variety of different jobs and then you know an individual gets a job and a year later they recidivate so yeah. it's it's not as as you said it's not just about the job it's about the provenance of the job it's about why why are we looking for a job for these individuals it's so that they could have increased self efficacy so they can be connected to the, their community so they can re enter um, re enter society and it's not about making their ambitions or their goals any any smaller or trying to fit them in a in a particular box they're not a different population they're a person like all of us who have who have goals and who have dreams that um you know shouldn't be fettered that should be encouraged and nurtured um which is why a post-prison education program so um yeah so wonderful i think can you um we're down to Mike, how much time do you think we have? I'm seeing, I'm sure we're at fifty seven twenty. Um, yeah, you probably should wrap up in the next couple minutes. All right. So, like, did you, Teresa? Did you get? Um, was the outcome at the end of your research? Did when you started it? Did you foresee it being where it ended, or did you, or or did the outcomes surprise you in any way, or or how, going into it, like when you first wrote to me, which I think was. June of last year, and we started introducing you to students, um, including some that are locked up. You know, did did you did you have an idea in your mind where what the outcome would be, or 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 was it vastly different than you thought about it, or did you not even think about where it was headed? You just wanted to research it and find out. Uh, yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Um, I didn't have a particular outcome that I was necessarily anticipating. I chose uh, to use Bender's social cognitive theory because I did think that, um, well, because they had used that theory in other disenfranchised populations. And I did believe that there was probably something, you know, uh, that required um, more, uh, more reflection and um, more bi-directional interaction going on there. But I would say um, that from reading the literature, just having more of a a surface level understanding of everything before actually speaking with the participants, I could understand why if I only engaged with what was written, I might think, okay, well, that's one box to tick uh, employment, right? And it was only after really speaking with people and understanding their, their stories and um, getting those rich narratives that I had full appreciation of, of the dynamism of their story and of why um, employment was important, but how it was important within the context of that story as well. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, you guys taught me, taught me a lot um, about the desistance process and about what's, what's important. But Ken and Maddie, I just want to ask each of you got to do this. You could divide the one minute and, that we've got left up. And but, I, but what was your initial reaction when you read Teresa's? 
basis. Each of you answer that. Especially compared to the work you do every day. Yeah, I personally just had a reaction to it where I was grateful for how much humanization it gave to the participants rather than just making them another number, which a lot of articles do and a lot of research does. Um, and so I think the results, um, particularly because you chose the social cognitive theory um, and framework to kind of analyze this issue, but just giving people a platform and a way to talk about themselves that doesn't reduce them to a statistic. Yeah, that was the one thing that I wanted to talk about as well was just the way that you seem to avoid or try to avoid reduction in all capacities. And I really appreciated how in depth um, your investigation of the whole concept was, but especially of each individual and that you treated um, each person as the individual that they were and gave everyone that like almost like special moment as you kind of talked about um, and helped elevate voices that should be heard more often. And then I also just appreciated, as I mentioned before, like having some more vocabulary now to reference why I've seen some of the stuff work that has worked and understanding <laughs> from yeah. an academic perspective and to hear from Teresa the um, like intersection between some of the philosophical ramblings that you had in there that were so interesting and then mixed with the cognitive psychology I thought was a great encapsulation of why a lot of this works which was cool to hear for sure. What are your next steps, Teresa? And then we're going to wrap it up. We don't have any choice. <laughs> Michael, flip the um, switch. So I am looking at extending the research um, with a doctorate at um, the University of Queens Belfast College in Northern Ireland. Um, but it, yeah, that's still something that's quite, like, there's a lot of vagaries in it right now. Um, I would love to continue working with post-prison education program, anything that I could do to, to support or help some of the participants that I met and any other individual yourselves um, would be something that I'd be very enthusiastically um, eager to, to get on board with. Well, uh, we're, I mean, we're indebted for, for the paper and, and, and society should be indebted for it. And, 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 and I hope people that we get it out to will read it. And again, um, you know, you can, anybody, you can write to me, ari.cone at postprisonedu.org or McKenna, and it's McKenna at postprisonedu.org or maddie.gates at postprison, and we can send this to you. And it's, it's just worth the time. So, thanks everyone. And Teresa, we'll see you back in the United States, maybe, or maybe we should all come to Ireland. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. That was great. Right. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.